took his army and he marched around the British flank. Again, Washington had escaped the much larger British force. But his army met a smaller British force here at Princeton. The weary Continentals fell into retreat at the attack of the British line. Washington appeared in front of the American army, riding towards those of us who were retreating and exclaimed, Parade with us, my brave fellows. There is but a handful of the enemy, and we will have them directly. A Continental Sergeant at Princeton. I shall never forget what I felt at Princeton on his account. When I saw him brave all the dangers of the field and his important life hanging, as it were, by a single hair with a thousand deaths flying around him, believe me, I thought not of myself. A Pennsylvania volunteer. As he would do countless times in battle, Washington rallied his troops by virtue of his own bravery. Throughout the war, his life seemed charmed. He had a, a lot of physical courage. He almost believed that he was invulnerable to bullets. He had three horses shot out from under him. He had bullet holes in his clothes. His hat was shot away. But he was never himself scratched once by a bullet or a bayonet. And he exposed himself uh, constantly. Several months earlier in New York, British buglers sounded a fox hunting tune as they pursued Washington and his fleeing army. Still smarting from the insult, Washington now shouted, It's a fine day for a fox chase, my boys, and spurred his horse after the retreating redcoats. As at Trenton, the British were routed. Washington didn't linger to savor his second victory in nine days. Instead, he rushed his army into winter quarters in the mountains near Morristown, New Jersey. You look at the map, from that location, he would have been astride or on the flank of the lines of communication, supply lines of the British leading across the state of New Jersey. The British could not get at him back in those mountains in the winter with an army in that day and age. So they had no choice but to leave New Jersey. So by winning two battles, very small battles really in terms of the numbers of soldiers engaged on either side, and by an operational maneuver, he wedged, or outgeneraled, if you will, the British completely out of New Jersey. And so when the, when the campaigning ended, the British had New York City. That's all they had to show for the largest expeditionary force they ever had sent anywhere for an entire year of campaigning. General William Howe seemed in no hurry to retaliate for the defeats at Trenton and Princeton. After all, he controlled the city of New York and was enjoying an affair with one of the most attractive women in America, Elizabeth Loring, the wife of his loyalist commissary of prisoners, Joshua Loring. Francis Hopkinson, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, would soon poke fun at Howe with a clever verse. Sir William, he, snug as a flea, lay all this time a-snoring, nor dreamed of harm as he lay warm in bed with Mrs. Loring. Francis Hopkinson. Finally, Sir William made his move. From New York, he sailed with more than 15,000 men south, then up the Chesapeake Bay. He obviously planned to take the largest city in America, Philadelphia. The guns of Fort Mifflin and Fort Mercer blocked an easier entry up the Delaware River into the rebel capital. With his Chesapeake Bay approach, Howe would have to cross overland for 50 miles to reach the city. On the 24th of August, 1777, Washington marched his own army through Philadelphia to intercept the enemy. Four regiments of light horse, four grand divisions of the army and the artillery marched 12 deep and yet took up above two hours in passing by. We have now an army well appointed between us and Mr. Howe. John Adams. A new member of that army was a 19-year-old major general from France who had never seen a musket fired in battle. His name 
was Marie-Joseph Paul-Yves Roche Gilbert de Motier, Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette is simply irresistible. He's, he's such an idealist. Jefferson later said that he had a canine appetite for fame. And somebody else said that he was a man of only one idea. But fortunately for him, it was the idea of the century, namely liberty. Washington loved this guy. He treated him like a son uh, and also like a younger brother throughout the whole war. Washington was basically aggressive and combative by nature, so he came down to contest Howe's advance against Philadelphia. And he did so at Brandywine on September the 11th. And there his army fought pretty well, but it was outflanked. Washington always seemed to have a problem protecting his flanks. There was a most infernal fire of cannon and musketry, most incessant shouting, incline to the right, incline to the left, halt, charge, the balls plowing up the ground, the trees cracking over one's head, the leaves falling as in autumn by the grape shot. The action was brilliant. Mr. Washington retreated, that is, ran away, and Mr. Howe remained master of the field a British officer at Brandywine. In his first battle, Lafayette was wounded. The next day, he wrote his young wife in France. Dear heart, Monsieur Les Anglais wounded me slightly in the leg, but it is nothing, for the ball did not touch bone or nerve. Others weren't so lucky. Joseph Townsend, a young Quaker, described the field of combat after the battle. Awful was the scene to behold. Such a number of fellow human beings lying together severely wounded and some mortally. A few dead, but a small proportion of them, considering the immense quantity of powder and ball that had been discharged. It was now time for the surgeons to exert themselves. Falling into the hands of a revolutionary war surgeon was a mixed blessing at best. With doctors working without antiseptics or anesthetics, and guided by fallacious concepts, even minor surgeries became life-threatening. The sickness and disease that ran rampant through the encampments claimed many more lives in the Revolutionary War than did actual combat. Howe followed up his victory at Brandywine with a surprise nighttime attack of Pennsylvania General Anthony Wayne's division at nearby Peyote. Relying solely on the British bayonet, the raid turned into a slaughter. Six days later, Howe sent Lord Charles Cornwallis into Philadelphia in triumph. At about 11 o'clock a.m., Lord Cornwallis with his division of the British and auxiliary troops amounting to about 3,000 marched into this city. To the great relief of the inhabitants who have too long suffered the yoke of arbitrary power and who testified their approbation of the arrival of the troops by the loudest acclamations of joy. Robert Morton, Philadelphia Loyalist. Philadelphia had fallen to the British. Soon Fort Mifflin, which guarded the Delaware River, would fall, opening a British sea route to the principal American city. But the American Congress had slipped out of Philadelphia and was already in session in nearby York. As the war developed, it was difficult for professional generals to realize that the kind of victory which would have been decisive in European terms, capturing the enemy's major cities, knocking out his major field army, something which would certainly in a European context have brought the enemy to negotiate to a political settlement, um, and that of course is what they were wanting in America, it turned out that even capturing all the major cities in America did not in fact bring the rebels to terms. Uh, and certainly in any conventional terms, Sir William Howe came very near to total victory, um, but not quite near enough. Washington was spoiling for another fight. And in the first week of October, he attacked the 